Hey everybody, it's Dr. Eric Balkavage, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Erica Riggleman. Erica, how are you today? I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. So we've got another guest on the podcast today, a fellow chiropractor, right? So one of the one of uh, one of the crew, I would say, and actually from one of my from my alma mater, Palmer College of, or mm -hmm. Palmer University of Chiropractic. So uh, we have Dr. Katie Takis with us today. Katie, how are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Well, we're happy to have you on the podcast. You've, you're going to bring a little bit different, um, uh, some a little bit different kind of ideas to what we're talking about on the Thyroid Answers podcast. We're going to talk about some a little bit thing, some things a little bit more nutrition wise, which will be good for our listeners. Mm -hmm. So, before we get into our little interview, can you talk uh, to the listeners, kind of give them a little bit of background about you? Uh, how you got into this space, especially from chiropractic into the nutrition world, and especially how that might relate to thyroid physiology. Sure. So I've always had a background in chemistry. I, in undergrad, I studied biomedical sciences, which was a heavy focus in biology and also chemistry. Um, when I decided to go to chiropractic school, at the time, I wanted to focus mainly on adjusting people. But as I was in school, I was finding that there were other things that the adjustment wasn't helping with people. Um, I went through some own uh, health issues of my own while I was in school and traditional medicine made me worse and was not helping me get better. So I ended up finding a functional medicine doctor that helped me get through some of my health issues that I was having. And that really piqued my interest in how the natural medicine world can work and how we can benefit many patients and people that may be struggling with some different health concerns. Um, so during that time, I went through the, the, within the chiropractic profession, we have diplomates and I hold a diplomate with the American Board of Chiropractic Internists. I'm also board eligible for my diplomate in nutrition, but I will be taking those in the spring. So lots of studying will be happening again soon. Um, but my focus with nutrition and um, functional medicine has really pushed me towards women's health. And the reason with that is I have a lot of friends, family that were having a lot of menstrual issues. And as I was starting to see patients, I was seeing that a lot of my patients were having a lot of these same complaints, um, symptoms of estrogen dominance, symptoms of hypothyroidism. And a lot of these women weren't getting answers for what was causing these symptoms, but were just told, take a pill, take a cream, take this and you'll feel better. In all reality, they're still feeling pretty horrible. So that's kind of where my interest came in and figured out what, what ways can we affect your diet and change your lifestyle and things that we can do to improve how you're processing maybe your hormones and how we can figure out why they're creating issues in the body. Excellent. And so, yeah, there is, you know, there, it's just a different model function of medicine, right? We're trying to get to the underlying causes. Dr. Eric and I talk about that all the time on the podcast. Like you can't, you can't drug yourself and you, you can't draw yourself healthy. Uh, you can't even supplement yourself healthy if you don't address the root cause issues. You know, meds, supplements, they can all be Band-Aid approaches. And we, use, we can use medicines, we can use supplementations to help somebody kind of manage their, their health, especially crisis mode. But ultimately, we have to get down to root cause issues if we're going to really help somebody long term. So there's a lot of talk in functional medicine, especially in the thyroid world, about what's the right diet. Every 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 couple of days, I see somebody posting what's the right, you know, what's the best diet for thyroid disorders. Is it vegan? Is it is it is it keto? Is keto safe? Is it paleo? What is the best diet? Um, so with your background, your experience, is there? I would say there isn't a diet that's perfect for a condition condition the diet really needs to be based on the individual but what about what's your take on the diets especially something maybe like somebody might think like and we've learned about this probably through blogs and posts and stuff that you know animal products are unhealthy and maybe eating animal products is unhealthy so if you focus more on a vegetarian or vegan diet that might be better for your thyroid physiology true not true what's your thought process on that so I'm going to say that that could be both true and false. Um, like you said, there's no one diet that's perfect for one condition. Um, there's not really this one size, it's not really one size fits all type manner. So if we're looking at a vegetarian or vegan diet, oftentimes um, these people tend to obviously have lower levels of protein that they're intaking because they're not getting protein from meat and things like that. Um, if they're following a really 
really healthy form of a vegetarian or a vegan diet. They may be, or a vegetarian diet, they may be getting a lot of their proteins from things like beans, legumes, nuts, um, and or excuse me, with a vegan diet. Whereas with a vegetarian diet, they may still be getting some proteins from um, fish if they're more of a pescatarian, or even if they're eating dairy products. However, when we start to see some of the issues is seeing lots and lots of soy being added to the diets. So there's a lot of mixed research out there talking about is soy good for the body, is soy not good for the body? And the biggest argument behind that is because soy is very soy contains isoflavones and these can help to these can also help to increase uh, estrogen production, or they also contain phytoestrogens, which can increase estrogen production in the body. Now, it's not necessarily a bad thing if you're only eating soy, you know, a couple times a week or on a very limited basis, but if we're looking at people who are eating soy for the majority of their meals, the majority of their snacks, this is where we can start to see some problems. Um, so for instance, I had a patient that came in and one of her biggest complaints was depression, um, and very, very low energy. So we did some hormone work with her and her estrogen levels came back very, very high, all of her estrogens. Um, we have three different types of estrogens in our bodies. Um, so all three of those came back elevated in her as well as her uh, estrogen metabolites. So we got to talking a little bit further and she started telling me that the majority of her diet was soy based. She was eating soy bacon, she was eating soy burgers, she was eating soy, everything. Um, and it was at every meal and including a lot of her snacks. So we were seeing this, in, I saw this increase in estrogen from coming from her diet. So what we started having her do was decrease the amount of soy in her diet. We, I started having her implementing some other types of proteins because she was using the soy specifically for protein. So I started having her add some fish into her diet and she started coming, cutting back on some of the soy, especially some of the processed soy that she was eating. Um, and we helped her kind of detox those, that, those estrogens out and her symptoms began to improve. Um, I haven't seen her in a really long time now because she's doing really well and hasn't needed to come in to see me. So that was kind of an example of how even a very high soy diet can influence your um, blood chemistries. So let me think, kind of let me let me kind of expand on that just a little bit for the listeners. So, you know, a lot of times when people say they're vegetarian or vegan, they 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 wind up being um, carbitarians, right? So mm -hmm. that becomes a problem too, uh, and so the excessive carbohydrates can create issues and problems from increased inflammation, dysbiosis. Um, it can trigger you know deactivation of thyroid hormone, number of issues. When you were talking about the soy can increase estrogen impact, we'll talk about that in a bit, how estrogen impacts you know, thyroid physiology directly, right? And we'll talk about the gland and absorption of iodine, so we'll get into that. But there's another thing I think we should just kind of expound on a little bit, and that is that a lot of the soy-based foods are, are Roundup ready, right? Which means that they are uh, modified so that they can be sprayed with Roundup doesn't kill the plant, but it kills all the weeds around it. And now what we know through the research is, is that the Roundup's an antibiotic. Uh, the antibiotic then disrupts your gut flora. Now we've got disrupted gut flora, which creates inflammation, creates leaky gut, trigger for autoimmunity, and another mechanism that it can create some issues. The last piece, and I don't know if you want to talk about it or if, if, if uh, I, you want me to discuss it, but you were talking about your patient with depression, um, and who has had high estrogen. And I think that's an important thing to kind of, ex, kind of expand on maybe a little bit if you feel comfortable doing that. And that is, why would estrogen cause depression? And I, I'm sure you're gonna get into serotonin metabolism and, and MAO, it kind of speeds that up. And then the other rebound effect from that is the impact that maybe MA or that estrogen has on COMT that can drive maybe anxiety. So they could get both of those things Mm -hmm. with increased estrogen, right? Correct. Well, and I think um, another thing that you kind of touched, or you were talking about having the Roundup Ready soy that we have, a lot of the research studies when you go online to look at comparing whether or not soy is bad for our diet or not, they often compare women in Japanese um, countries because they have diets that are very high in soy, yet we still don't see those elevated levels of estrogen in those countries, even though they're eating soy much more frequently than we do in the States. Um, so that kind of also makes a good point that perhaps it's the way that our crops are being harvested here in the States. 
compared to the crops being raised in other countries. And that could be why we're seeing some of those different comparisons as well. Um, so to note on, kind of go back to your question on how her depression may have been affected by this, is she also was having sleep problems. Um, so to kind of get a little bit more into that, one of our main neurotransmitters, tryptophan, this is something that ends up getting converted into what we call 5-HTP. 5-HTP then gets converted into serotonin. And serotonin is a neurotransmitter that makes us feel really happy, makes us feel good. When we have low levels of that, that's typically when we associate um, that with depression. Now, what's really important to take into account here is serotonin also gets converted into melatonin. So if our levels of serotonin are too low, then we're not gonna have enough of it to even get converted into melatonin. And now we start to see this vicious cycle of not getting enough sleep because our body isn't able to produce melatonin. And then you're already suffering from this depression, which sometimes causes fatigue to begin with. So then this person is kind of stuck in this vicious cycle of depression and fatigue. Um, so those are some ways that that can be affected. And you also made a comment about how the treated soys have antibiotics in them. Now, if we're being exposed to antibiotics, and like you had mentioned, this can have a huge impact on our gut, and this can disrupt our whole gut microbiome. And if we're seeing a disruption in the bacteria that exists within our gut, that can influence a whole slew of things in our body, not to mention our overall brain chemistry and um, our emotions. So serotonin is primarily produced in our gut. And if we're seeing the gut not function as well as it should be, or there's some sort of bacterial irregularity, then that may make it difficult for the body to produce levels of serotonin that it needs, which again can contribute to that vicious cycle of la lack of sleep and depression. Great. Yeah. And I also think that when uh, going back to the vegetarian diet as well as that in the gut is that when you're eating a vegetarian diet, sometimes you're eating some of the foods that can promote the leaky gut and that can lead to the higher estrogens and all of those things kind of play a vicious role. And we know how important the gut is for thyroid health, but the vegetarian diet itself could be promoting a little bit of the leaky gut, whether it's because you're consuming way too much soy or we're just consuming maybe some legumes and things that may irritate the gut in, in combination together. And if you're not actively healing the leaky gut, it often can contribute and play a role in your thyroid physiology kind of going astray a little bit. Awesome. Yeah. And I think the, one of the key things we want to kind of point out there is we're not anti-vegetarian diet. We're not anti-vegan yeah. diet. We're not anti, you know, I'm not anti really anything except processed food, heavy processed food diet. And, you know, we're, we live in a world where some of that food tastes good and we want to enjoy ourselves every once in a while. So you shouldn't be living in a life where you feel like you're depriving yourself of everything. But if your diet is dominated by processed foods, non foods as far away as possible from their natural state, that's probably going to be problematic. And so if you're going to choose a diet just because somebody else did well on it, that doesn't mean that diet's going to do well for you. And as Dr. Erica said, if you're eating a lot of those plant based foods and you're eating those plant based foods out of season you may those foods may really have a greater level of irritation on your GI tract because they're not really meant to be force ripened and then they they have a higher level of toxicity for some people so they they can really create an issue we i see it in my practice and you guys can kind of comment on this as well that people do really well when they switch their diet aggressively. It doesn't matter really what it is. If they go from a normal diet to a carnivore diet, they seem to, after a couple of days, they seem to do really well. If they go to a vegetarian diet, they seem to go do really well because they're changing their gut biome to some degree and they're probably just cleaning up their diet a bit. But I do see people, once they start getting longer and longer into a vegetarian or vegan diet, if they're not really good at their diet and they're consuming a lot of processed foods instead of whole foods and they're not diversifying really well, they really do start to have some chronic health issues. And we won't get into the complexity of that, but do you guys see that in your practice as well? Yeah. Yeah. And I, the patient that I had mentioned, her, like I said, most of her soy was coming from processed, processed foods. She was eating tofu or, you know, soy bacon, which is very processed. So um, even having some soy on occasion isn't bad, but you that it would like I always recommend organic um, non-GMO forms of soy when you do have that, um, or there's different options in terms of foods that you can substitute as well. Like I think it's also the, I also ahead. think it's important to ask the patient 
in front of you, why, why are you choosing, like if they already come in and they're a vegetarian or a vegan, what made them go that? Some people have the, the moral thing that they're looking at. I've also had patients come in and say, I just don't tolerate meat very well. I don't digest it very well. And that makes me think, okay, well, there's something going on in the digestive tract that we're not, able, if we don't have enough hydrochloric acid, you know, maybe we, we've got dysbiosis going on. There's something going on in the gut that is deterring you away from eating the meat. So let's work on those underlying foundations. So, you know, asking the question of why did you choose that route, I think is really important for patient care as well. I agree. I, I think that's great. That's awesome. So let's get into the next piece that we were just talking about soy. It has estrogenic properties and qualities. Can you dis discuss how estrogen might create problems with thyroid physiology? Sure. So estrogen, um, estrogen and progesterone are two of the main sex hormones that we see in women, and they should help to balance each other out. If we start to see excess estrogen or too much estrogen production in the body, this could be one due to the body producing too much or even taking it in via some sort of hormone replacement therapy or even some forms of birth control can elevate estrogen levels. So what can happen with that is estrogen can increase something called TBG or thyroxine binding globulin. Um, and what that means is it binds to thyroxine or T4. It basically attaches to T4, pulls it out of use from the bloodstream and kind of makes it unavailable to the body to use. So the body ends up seeing that there's low levels of T4, which can eventually start to create other issues. If we're not having enough T4, then there's not enough T4 to get converted into T3, which is our most active thyroid hormone and what gives the majority of the action to our body. So if estrogen levels are so high that they're pulling that T4 out of its activity, then we're going to start to see a decrease in overall thyroid function um, just due to how it's binding to the different receptors. Yeah, so thyroid binding gland for the listeners. So when the thyroid hormone gland makes hormones, T4, T3 primarily, that T4, T3 is released into the bloodstream. It's escorted around the body by these binding globulins. And thyroid binding globulin is the, you can think of it essentially as the Uber driver that escorts the thyroid hormone around the body. And then when the thyroid hormone gets to tissues and cells that need thyroid hormone, the T3, T4 comes off that thyroid binding globulin, becomes free. So when you look on your lab report and you see T4, T3, that's what that's typically all, that's bound hormone and free hormone. And then when you see a marker free T3 or free T4, that's the free fraction. And that's what's available to get into the cells. And that's really important because it would be like if if the Uber driver drove you to the mall but never left you out of the car, you couldn't go shopping right? So if the thyroid gland is making thyroid hormone, but it can't become free, then it can't get into the cells. So your blood levels could look totally normal, but if it can't get into the cells, you're going to have hypothyroid symptoms, and that's the key. And that's what we talk about is, is cellular hypothyroidism, which is there's not enough thyroid hormone T3 reaching that receptor, and that triggers the hypothyroid symptoms. So Definitely, that can have an impact. And another, another indicator is sometimes that not only is thyroid binding globulin elevated when there is uh, high estrogen, but almost all the binding globulins. So all the sex hormone binding globulins can be elevated, which can really reduce free fractions of lots of things, cortisol, estrogen, testosterone, all because all these hormones need these binding globulins to get escorted around the body. How about other ways that estrogen might impact the gland directly? So what, um, are you talking like from medications or? Well, we could talk about how, it, like whether it's medication or, or other, there's the estrogen could definitely impact something that called the sodium iodine symporter. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you feel comfortable getting into how that might impact the sodium iodine symporter and how that might affect the gland? Um, I'll let you answer that one if, if you don't mind. Yeah. So for the listeners, estrogen, when you take estrogen or birth control, Estrogen can reduce something called your sodium iodine symporter. So that sodium iodine symporter is how you get iodine from the GI tract in from your food through the GI tract and into the bloodstream. You also have sodium iodine symporters on your thyroid gland and your lymph tissue and almost every tissue has got a sodium iodine symporter and it needs to transfer to pull iodine in and pushes sodium out. Estrogen actually blocks that sodium iodine symporter. So if you have high estrogen circulating, that sodium iodine symporter 
can then be inhibited. So you can't get iodine into the, into the body. You can't get it into the gland, into the thyroid gland or tissues. And therefore you're going to have hypothyroidism as a glandular hypothyroid state because you, you, you just can't get enough iodine into the, into the gland and into the body. And that's a big deal because really we don't have a great marker of iodine deficiency. There's a lot of argument about iodine deficiency and doctors will say, well, you can't do run an iodine test on somebody because it's, it's not accurate. Other, doc, other labs and doctors say it is. And the only way to determine iodine deficiency is to take a whole population. I, I, I think we're at a loss there. And that has somebody who, who may not uh, be getting sufficient iodine into their system because they're on birth control, they're on hormone therapy, or they have extra adipose tissue. And they've got this high levels EV, their primary estrogens or estrogen metabolites shutting down their sodium iodine sim border, inducing a hypothyroid state. Yeah, you, I think I that? think that I, I 100% agree with all of that. And I think that you know high estrogen is 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 very common in a lot of patients, but we also can't leave out. I think the the flip side of that. Um, you know, where patients may have low estrogen. So I think that, you know, with all things in the body, there has to be that, that balance. Um, could you speak to a little bit on the flip side? Do you see where patients maybe going through menopause start to develop some thyroid symptoms on the flip side and how maybe their estrogen dropping can lead to some thyroid issues? Yeah. So this is something that I see quite frequently, actually, a lot of women that come in, they're starting to have some of those symptoms of um, low estrogen, where they're having maybe a lower uh, sex drive than they used to have, they're having some vaginal dryness, or they have painful intercourse. Um, and oftentimes, they're starting to have a lot more fatigue, maybe they're starting to lose some hair, um, symptoms that kind of show up with hypothyroidism, or low functioning thyroid. And oftentimes I explain to them that these symptoms are occurring probably because their estrogen levels are dropping too quickly. Um, so oftentimes some things that we talk about is what can we do to obviously help improve those numbers so that they don't have such a hard crash. Um, and there's certain things that we can do that can help um, increase estrogen production. If you wanted to, you could, going back to the soy, we could do something as basic as having you drink an organic soy high quality soy milk you know once uh, once a day this is me not saying these high amounts of soy but if you're taking in a little bit then that's kind of a natural way that you can work on increasing some of those estrogen levels but also how this can start to affect the thyroid is if we don't have enough estrogens to prime some of those receptors then that can also affect how the thyroid is uh, interpreting its receptors with that i think i answered your question yeah absolutely <laughs> so what it, when we're talking about, we're kind of on this, we got on this tangent about estrogen and it can be impacted, especially with vegetarian or vegan diets due to what people are consuming, especially from the soy perspective. We talk a little bit about too much estrogen and how it can impact both the gland and the transporter. So it can cause both glandular hypothyroidism, it can impact and cause cellular hypothyroidism. So how how is a person or how do you how do you consider a person should be kind of evaluated that maybe they have an estrogen problem there's some testing blood testing there's urine testing there's saliva testing what's what is this how do you look at looking at somebody's estrogen levels to determine whether they have too much too little so I personally like to use urine testing for that. Um, gold or blood testing is considered the gold standard. But the reason I like to look at urine testing when we're looking at hormones is because estrogen has to be detoxified through two different processes in the liver or, or two different phases, phase one and phase two. Now, phase one is where we really work on decreasing the estrogen that's available to the body. And phase two is working on getting that estrogen out or actually detoxing what, whatever it is that we want out of the body out. However, I like to look at urine testing because we're able to see both the hormones and their metabolites. And why this is important is we want to see what's happening to the hormones as they're being broken down and metabolized by the body to get these metabolites. So estrogen goes through, along with other hormones that come in our body, our thyroid hormones, even drugs that we take, um, different supplements, things have to go through the liver to be properly detoxified. And estrogen um, is broken down and metabolized in phase one of 
uh, liver detoxification. And then phase two is when we really work on pushing those things back out of the body. So the only way that we're able to push those things out of the body is either via our urine or our feces. So by doing a urine test, we're able to see those metabolites of those hormones that were broken down. So this not only allows me to see you know, estradiol, estrone, estriol, but it also allows me to see the metabolites or the breakdowns of those hormones. Um, we can also look at testosterone and its metabolites that way. We can look at DHEA. Um, we can look at all sorts of different hormones in those pathways. And then that helps me see, is this a conversion issue with some of these sex hormones? Um, is there too much testo Is there too little testosterone? And that's why we're also having too little estrogen because testosterone gets converted into a, our estrogens. Um, maybe we have, and that's why we're seeing low estrogens. Um, in a case where maybe we're seeing high estrogens, it's also important to look at testosterone because sometimes women have symptoms of estrogen dominance and it's because they're pulling all of their testosterone to get converted into estrogen. So they have low libido um, and then they have these symptoms of estrogen dominance. Um, and like I said, that can also go the other way. If we're at a complete deficit of our sex hormones and everything's lower, we see this global depression, we don't have enough testosterone, then that can't even create the estrogens that we need. So that's why I prefer to use the urine test because that way I can see how your body is producing your hormones and how it's metabolizing it. Because looking at the liver function is really important when we're talking about detoxifying both sex and uh, thyroid hormones. Yeah, and I think you could, for the listeners, if you've had blood hormones taken, there's no problem with that, but it only really tells us what's in the bloodstream. And many times that blood value can actually look low. And so somebody might assume you're in a deficit, but when we look at the urine panel, we can kind of see, is, the, is the, the primary hormones low, but the metabolites may actually be elevated. And that can let us know that, as, as Dr. Katie was saying, that, hey, we've got problems with the liver, bile, gallbladder function, and, and maybe the clearance mechanisms here. Um, and so I see this for happen to women a lot, which is they have symptoms of, of what somebody might think are, are menopausal symptoms. They get put on estrogen as a way to support those hormones. And then you look at their metabolites and they're sky high. They don't have the ability to metabolize those out cleanly. And now they're building those things up. And those metabolites of those estrogens are the things that can be really, really toxic to the system and create more tissue damage. They can disrupt. We're talking about liver function here. I mean, the estrogen metabolites can actually block um, the transport of toxins into the liver to be detoxed. They, mm -hmm. Those metabolites can block the export of those toxins out of the liver through something called the MRP2 channels that Dr. Kelly Halderman talks about all the time with her phase 2.5. We have to we have to bring things into the liver, detox them through phase one, phase two, and then phase 2.5 is actually getting them out of these channels into the bile, and then getting them out of, out of the system and through the pool and through the poop. Right, And if those MR2P2 channels are actually blocked by estrogen or things coming in are blocked by estrogen, we can, we can really have some significant estrogen dominance issues that may or may not be picked up on the blood test. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let's say you are working with a practitioner. You've, you know, you've determined that we have high estrogen. What are some dietary and lifestyle things that um, a patient or a person, a listener can do to help lower maybe some estrogen in the body? Good question. So I oftentimes like to talk to my patients about how important their diets are, because like we said earlier, supplements themselves can be great at times, but you know, if we can fix the body by choosing different foods and impacting our diet, then that can be lifelong lifestyle changes that we can continue to use. So some things, one of the first things I like to check with my patients on is, are you being exposed to a lot of estrogens outside of your food? Um, this could be things from um, using anti-aging creams that maybe have some sort of hormones in them. Um, this can be exposure to things like BPA, um, other things that are in our makeup and in a lot of our lotions and hairsprays and cosmetics and everything that we use. So I do like to make sure that women, I like to educate them so they can go through and make sure if they are exposing themselves to something over and over, they can remove that from their, from their lifestyle. 
um, and removing some of those things is obviously a good place to start. Now, if we're talking about taking in foods and how that can also affect our bodies, I always recommend um, cruciferous greens. And the reason with that is it contains something called I3C, which then gets converted into something called DIM. Now, DIM is a very popular supplement that we I've been hearing, we hear a lot about now. Um, as practitioners, we do use that at times as well. And what that does is it helps to um, basically detoxify the estrogens out of the body. Um, it can also help to block the conversion of testosterone into estrogen if we're seeing um, too much of that occurring, or we call that an aromatase inhibitor. Um, so, but the important thing with this is, is if you are eating your cruciferous vegetables, I recommend eating them raw so you can get a lot of the nutrients that way. Um, if you're having a problem, and this kind of goes back to the gut stuff we were talking about, uh, the conversion of this I3C into DIM does require uh, stomach acid. So if you're having digestive issues where you're not producing enough stomach acid and you're not able to digest your foods as well, that may make it difficult for you to be getting those benefits from the vegetables in that way. Um, this may be at the time where you would talk with your practitioner about possibly supplementing DIM. Um, definitely work with your doctors on that. But um, if you can fix the gut, then getting that DIM or that conversion from the vegetables can also help to detoxify some of those estrogens. Yeah, and, and, and these, these products can work real well to kind of pull the, the estrogens. If there's high primary estrogens, it can pull those primary estrogens through that metabolism pathway. If some of the metabolites are going down the more problematic or toxic pathways, it can shift them down the kind of the healthier, uh, what they call the 2OH pathway. And so they could be really good. But there are, you, I don't think that most women want to just start pounding down DIM supplementation, right? Because there's, um, there's a caveat to taking the DIM if you don't have sufficient estrogens, right? So we can drive, you can actually drive yourself into having low estrogen sy symptoms if you're taking too much DIM or you're taking it inappropriately. Mm -hmm. So for anybody who's listening to the podcast, we're talking about if there's estrogen dominance and we see that on labs, um, it's good to take. But that's where if you, if you take it at supplemental form and you take too much or you take it too long uh, or you're, maybe you need to pulse it and you're not, you're taking too consistently, you may actually diminish your primary estrogens and drive some, some low estrogen symptoms and create some issues which is why I think when you say, hey, let's do this from diet nutrition, it's probably a better way to do it. It's really hard to, to overdo the dim from With your vegetables. <laughs> yeah. um, well, another thing I wanted to add, because we've been talking about detoxification of the liver and the gut health is, Another thing that we really need to focus on with nutrition is that uh, you're moving your bowel movements regularly when you're trying to detoxify estrogens. Um, so just like we want to get estrogens detoxified in the liver with phase one, we want to get them out with phase two. So if we're seeing issues or you're not moving your bowels regularly enough, that means that that stuff is sitting in you that still hasn't been pushed out. So again, that may kind of take you back to needing to address some gut health issues if there are some issues there, um, but also increasing your fiber by eating a lot of crucifixion vegetables um, can help to increase the number of bowel movements. You can also look for adding types of um, insoluble and soluble fiber into your diet, and that can also help um, get things moving a little bit better, quite literally. And if you, if you haven't had a, if you haven't had a hormone panel done, or you, you, you haven't had your blood work done, you haven't had a urinary test done, and you're like, well, how do I know if I have estrogen issues? You can look up like, high estrogen symptoms, low estrogen symptoms. But the other thing is you can, there's some real, there's some clues, right? So if you're an easy answer, sometimes I tell women, if you have bigger boobs, bigger hips, bigger butt, bigger belly, you probably got a little bit extra estrogen because estrogen is proliferative. Mm -hmm. But there's an all, there's a common real clue in blood work and health history sometimes when you see, when we see people with gallbladder problems, gallstones, gallbladder dysfunction, they've had a cholecystectomy already, when they eat fatty foods, they don't feel good, Ast an extra estrogen can actually shut down um, something called the sphincter of odi, which then limits your body's ability to get bile from the, from the gallbladder into the GI tract and at pancreatic enzymes into the GI tract. So it shuts it down. So almost, if, you've, if, you've, if you're a listener and you've had gallbladder stone, if you had stones or cholecystectomy and you got a butt 
boobs and belly, you probably have some estrogen issues. Would you agree with that, Dr. Katie? Yeah. Um, some other things that can be signs of estrogen dominance, and I ask a lot of my patients these questions because I ask a lot of period questions. Um, having really heavy menstrual cycles or really heavy bleeding can be a sign. Having a lot of clots with bleeding or what this looks like is kind of these thick red, women describe them to me as chunks sometimes, but they kind of look like these mucousy red clots. Um, and if you have very large clots, and I like to think of these in size of coins, so having clots much over the size of a dime, lots of them can also be a sign of having estrogen dominance. Um, and then of course the mood changes, um, breast tenderness between ovulation and the actual menstrual cycle starting can be a sign of that, um, along with you know, many other complaints as well. And so we, we should not leave men out, since I am a man, right? Men can have estrogen dominance as well, right? Correct. So do you feel comfortable kind of, what would a man might, ex, what would they might experience symptom-wise if they had too much estrogen in their system? Yeah, so they may, um, so our pathways are very similar in how the conversion of hormones work. So their testosterones can also get converted into estrogens. Um, so males might notice something called gynecomastia or enlargement of the breast tissue. Um, they may notice a decreased sex drive because testosterone is what gives us our drive for sex. And if testosterone is getting overconverted into estrogen or if that pathway is being blocked, then that can cause that to happen. Um, the male may also have some fatigue because testosterone also helps give us some energy. And if that, again, is getting shifted more into estrogen, then that can be um, a symptom as well. So if you've got moobs, right? <laughs> if you've got, um, if you're highly emotional, if you're sitting down and watching a basketball game and somebody gets fouled and you start having tears in your eyes, you might have an estrogen issue. If you yeah. got, the, you know, the man's never going to admit that. It's going to have to be the wife that's going to have to say, you got an estrogen problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. So it happens. And I, I mean, I just had a patient the other day. I mean, he's a he's a man's man does adventure racing does all these things. And yet, um, you know, we ran hormones and he's thinking he's test, you know, that he's just got low testosterone and his te his testosterone levels and his androgens aren't necessarily low from a production standpoint, but he's doing exactly what Dr. Katie was saying is he's aromatizing those due to inflammation, driving down that estrogen pathway and his metabolites were all elevated. So he's, you know, depressed, moody, anxiousness, disrupted sleep. You know, he's got, you know, classic symptoms. He's emotional, um, you know, and he's gaining weight, belly fat, boobs, and, you know, it happens to men too. And it'll drive down a male's thyroid physiology. Mm -hmm. But let's turn the tails here. Let's turn this a little bit because we talked about vegetarian and veganism. We don't want anybody saying we're not giving, talking about anybody else or giving a hard time to another diet. So the other really popular diet right now is the ketogenic diet. Do you, as you know, with your background in nutrition, is, what are the pros and cons maybe of a ketogenic diet on thyroid physiology? So just to give a little bit of information on what the ketogenic is for people that maybe don't know, the idea of the ketogenic diet is to deplete your body of glucose so that you can thrive on ketones. So how this process works is the human body loves glucose. That's what our body thrives on. That's what our brain thrives on. And that's what it prefers. We get glucose from everything that we eat mostly from our carbohydrates. So when we restrict the carbohydrates like we do with the ketogenic diet, you're no longer getting glucose into the body to use for energy. So the body has to get energy from somewhere else. So it'll start pulling your fat from your body and that'll convert that into ketones. And ketones can then be used to fuel the body with energy. Our body is also really awesome in the fact that it can create glucose from fats and we can create, we can create all different types of things from all the different foods that we eat. But one of the issues that we do see sometimes with calorie restriction um, in terms of re or in relating to the thyroid is we will see a drop in T3 at times. And T3 gives us the most action to our body. So if we start to see those lower levels of T3, that can also give us those symptoms of hypothyroidism or low functioning thyroid. Now, like we were talking about at the beginning of the podcast, there's not really a perfect diet for every type of person. Um, the ketogenic diet is also 
very anti-inflammatory. It can help to decrease a lot of inflammatory levels. It's, uh, there's a lot of research that shows it's really good for helping with insulin resistance, um, helping people lose weight, which is a big complaint that we see nowadays. I'm sure both of you do as well, um, especially with people that have thyroid problems. Weight loss is a big complaint that I typically hear. Um, so that's one reason that we want to be a little bit careful to maybe not necessarily go for a carbohydrate restriction, especially when we're first working with the person, because we don't want to drive their levels of T3 down if they're already in a hypothyroid state. Um, so that's kind of how the ketogenic diet may affect the thyroid in a way. Yeah, I think the just like with the vegetarian, you have to ask, well, what what does that diet consist of? Because not every person that's a vegetarian is their diet the same. Not every person that's on keto is their diet the same. They could look totally different. You have the people that are eating butter, bacon, and cheese, and that's it. And then you have the people that are eating, you know, good quality fats, but mostly, you know, some good leafy greens mixed in there. I often see with a lot of my patients that are coming in that are already doing the ketogenic diet they're not even touching vegetables because they're, they're honestly afraid it's going to pull them out of ketosis. And that's like the, the end all be all for them is that I've got to be, I got to stay in ketosis. So I have to continue to eat this, the cheese, the cream, the butter, the bacon, and some of those things are very processed and can create inflammation itself. So yes, ketogenic can be anti-inflammatory, but to a certain degree, if the foods you're eating are inflammatory, you're kind of tipping the scales and you're kind of trading one thing for another and just creating another issue for people. Correct. So yeah, for instance, like you said, I mean, I've had people that have come in and told me their breakfast in the morning on a keto diet is black coffee with butter and a you know bacon, which, okay, that is technically keto, but you could make a plate full of zucchini that you cook with avocado oil and you could have a side of you could eat avocado oil with that, um, maybe add a little bit of meat or some sort of protein with the meal. And or you still could have a high quality bacon if you want to. But like you said, there's usually a lack in vegetables, which then that goes back to what we were talking about previously of helping with that phase two detoxification process because you're not getting enough of that fiber that can help with the bowel movements. So yes, I agree with you on that too. Yeah, and so there's, I think the key takeaway here is, you know, there, if we have to talk about diet, like, and we're talking about, okay, you're hypothyroid, or you think you're hypothyroid, what's the best diet? You know, all the diets have the potential, potential to work for someone to improve their physiology, but we shouldn't be dogmatic, like only vegetarians healthy or only vegans healthy or only paleos healthy or only ketos healthy or only um, carnivores healthy. They all have the potential to help change our physiology and they all have the potential to either make somebody better or make somebody worse. And everybody's a unique case. And I think if we have to give some general guide guidelines and, and Dr. Katie, I think Dr. Eric and I, our general guidelines for people are, um, you know, eat real food. You know, before you start going down the train of should I be keto, should I be carnivore, should I be um, whatever, how about we just start working on the basic things? What's the easiest thing to do? And that is, or I'm not going to say easy. I, I'll say the simplest thing to do is to eat, just eat more real whole food. Even before you start really stressing over is it organic or not organic, how about just eat more real food closer to its real state and start from there? Because I see people, and I'm, you guys can comment on this as well, who they're on a processed food diet, and then you start talking to them about um, you know, anti-inflammatory diets or, or it's starting down that process, and they start looking at all these foods that they don't eat, vegetables, different forms of protein. Well, I don't eat that. I don't like that. I don't do that. And, there's, and then they start down the next thing like, well, if I got to do it, then I'm gonna only going to buy organic. And then, and then you know, and they start trying, you know, coming up with reasons why it's they can't do it versus, hey, let's just start simple. And simple is often eat real food, lightly processed, lightly cooked, steamed, slow roasted, slow cooked, those types of things. Would you guys both agree with that? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Um, and that's a big, that brings a big point up to make me think of something. Um, when I work with my patients, a lot of times they do ask that question, what diet is best for me? Should I do this diet? or this diet or this diet. And like you said, my main focus isn't necessarily what diet, but eat the good quality foods. And so, and I have seen sometimes somewhat of an anxiety complex form around restricting foods and trying to be on these really strict diets where I've seen the patients go from 
yes, their diet is cleaner, but they've increased their stress and anxiety around eating so much that that's actually having a really negative effect on the body as well, because they're obsessing over when should I eat this or can I do this or am I in ketosis or you know what what can I have and can't have where if we're just encouraging them to eat the whole foods like like you were saying um, that that I think even decreases the stress and anxiety around their dietary changes. Absolutely, Absolutely. And, for, and for some of these people, just talking to them about eating a whole food diet is stressful mm -hmm. because they look at it and they're like, I don't eat green beans, I don't eat Brussels sprouts, I don't eat lettuce, I don't eat right. That's why we're having this discussion because most of what you eat is processed and it's devoid of really good nutrition. And the first thing to do before we worry about anything is just get you started down that pathway. Yeah. And, and, and another point to that is when we're talking about the dietary stuff, if you've been told to do an anti-inflammatory diet and you're not feeling well on that diet, then that's probably not the best diet for you. There's something in there that's creating issue. If you're still having GI distress, then that's where you want to see a functional medicine practitioner who can help you understand, okay, why is that diet not doing well? Um, we're going to have a, a guest on, I haven't told Dr. Eric yet, but we're going to have a guest on as one of my patients who's, uh, who's a medical doctor who we've, you know, who's doing an autoimmune paleo diet. And, you know, we wind, we wound up actually because he was still struggling with his health issues on an auto, auto AIP diet. We just did a, you know, Hey, let's try carnivore for a couple of days just to see what changes. And as crazy as it sounds, and I know there's a lot of uproar on the carnivore diet, but that carnivore diet was the switch that really made the dramatic differences in, it, in his health. Um, off all his meds in, a very, in like two months, losing all his weight, feeling great, all the symptoms are improving. And it was, you know, would I typically say to somebody, hey, healthy diet is the carnivore diet? I would typically not say that. But if you're doing a diet, you've done a SIBO diet, you've done autoimmune paleo diet, or you've done... Um, vegetarian diet and you're still not feeling well there's some you may be reacting to some of the foods that you switch to and so just because it works for somebody else who has Hashimoto's or an immune issue or a gut issue doesn't mean it's the right diet for you you guys want to comment on that no I 100% agree I like we preach this over and over the one diet is not the fit for every single person I think it comes down to individuality and how your body digests things and how it's processing and we all have different genes and we all have different ancestors that you know the way that they were you know the environment where we all live I think our microbiome plays a role so there's so many factors that play into it that yeah I think a lot of this is I hate to say it trial and error but yeah you you have to kind of play around with different things and find out what works for you and you know it's not going to work for everybody else yeah i agree um yeah i'm sure you both have this where patients come in and they say well some my friend did this diet and she has hashimoto's and she feels great and yeah it's not there's not a one size fits all that's not what we do with healthcare. And unfortunately, I wish it was easier than that, but yes, it does sometimes come down to this trial and error. Um, sometimes people end up having foods that they definitely want to avoid, like uh, Dr. Eric was saying. Um, and actually a lot of research studies have even shown that changing your diet in terms of the amount of carbohydrates you're eating to the amount of proteins that you're eating, just changing those things can actually influence the bacteria that exist within your gut. And that can happen in as short as 24 hours after eating a meal. So the food that we eat plays a huge role in not only our gastrointestinal tract, but that microbiome plays a huge influence on our overall health in general. So those foods can definitely impact um, everything in our body. So I try to explain to patients, I know if you want to have, you know, they say, can I cheat? Or they say, I'm dairy free, but I still have dairy, you know, three days a week. And then it's like, well, you still, still may be affecting your gut microbiome and you still may be creating those inflammatory cytokines that is continuously increasing inflammation in your body. So I do always try to stress if you're trying a new type of diet or if your doctor's recommending something that you really need to stick with it for at least a month until you can really say whether or not you're having benefits from it unless you're having very obvious symptoms like uh, dr eric was describing where they're still feeling very sick all the time but you do have to give it a chance to kind of work too yeah and i also think that <clears throat> switching things up just because somebody's doing great on keto today doesn't mean that six months down the road they should still be on keto you know i think that there's there's benefit to switching things up. You're creating metabolic flexibility. You're kind of 
your body gets used to, you know, you're eating the same three or four things, your body's going to get used to it. And you may even start to develop sensitivities to those foods if you keep bombarding the system with them. So I think that whether it's seasonal eating or switching from, you know, a keto diet to maybe doing some carb cycling, and then you go back to keto, I think that keep, keeping that metabolic flexibility is really important with, with diet and changing it up once in a while. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So from a, if we were going to finish off this podcast, right. And we talked for, for the most part, we talked about nutrition, the impact of maybe what happens when we do a vegetarian or vegan diet, how that can impact um, estrogen physiology and how that can trigger hypothyroidism, whether it's glandular or cellular. We talk a little bit about keto, how people who are on a, on a ketogenic diet may struggle a little bit with a, uh, uh, with their thyroid physiology, or they may struggle just on that diet a little bit. How would you, Dr. Katie, if you had to leave the listeners with, let's say three tips uh, for uh, nutrition, if they've, if they've got hypothyroidism or chronic hypothyroid symptoms, uh, whether it's glandular, cellular, what would be the three key nutrition tips you might advise somebody on? Um, I think the one we, the three of us hit pretty hard already is eat whole foods. Um, and like we were already talking about, you can eat a lot of those cruciferous vegetables and it would take you a lot of eating a lot of those cruciferous vegetables to get to the point of not overdosing yourself, but giving yourself too much that we could see with possibly giving yourself too much of a supplement. So definitely eating a lot of cruciferous vegetables. Um, and I, highly, I recommend that regardless of what diet you want to do. If you want to do keto, if you want to do uh, intermittent fasting, if, which we didn't even talk about, if you want to, any of those different types of diets, vegetables should be filling the majority of your plate. So I always encourage people to eat, eat more vegetables, eat more vegetables, eat more vegetables. Um, the other thing that I would say is if you are trying to follow these different types of diets and you're having issues where you're not knowing what exactly is contributing to maybe some of your symptoms, you could either, either look into some different types of food testing our food sensitivity testing, I usually recommend doing ones that look at IgG and IgA, or two different types of immunoglobulins. That's how we can see the different um, um, immune responses to the different foods. Um, and Or you could try to keep a food journal. This is a little bit more difficult, but keep track of everything that you eat over the course of several weeks. And also keep track of sim your symptoms. And keep a journal of that every single day so that you can try and correlate if something that you're eating is affecting your symptoms. If that's not working out for you, that's when I typically recommend doing the testing so you can get the black and white objective data. Um, the second tip I guess I would say is to make sure that you're also um, getting enough sleep. So we didn't talk about stress a whole lot today and how it can affect the body, but um, stress can play a major role in just inflammation in general in the body. So if we're getting too stressed out or we're we're running ourselves ragged like a lot of us Americans do. We work too much and we rest too little. That constant stress can create a lot of inflammation in the body. Um, it can end up elevating your glucose levels, which can actually lower your levels of TSH in the blood, which can, can contribute to the hypothyroid symptoms. Um, and then your overall fatigue can make it difficult for your body to heal. Um, a lot of times people, I think, don't credit enough how important sleep is to our bodies. So definitely encourage people to make sure they're getting enough sleep. Um, and then I guess the third takeaway would just to be, if you are having um, some of these concerns and you've tried doing this stuff on your own, definitely try to meet with a functional medicine practitioner so they can figure out where the issue is stemming from. We talked a lot about birth control today. We talked a lot about gut health today. We talked about diet today. So it may not be just one thing that's contributing to your overall symptoms, but a combination of all of these different things contributing to the thyroid. So you, you know, it may take looking back into the gut and figuring out, okay, the gut health is really poor. Let's improve the health, the gut of the, the health of the gut. Then we start to see improvements in hormones. Then we start to see improvements in just symptoms in general. Um, so that's kind of the last thing that I would recommend would be to follow up with somebody if you're not able to kind of, I guess, handle this on your own. Good. I think those are all great things. Yeah, I think it's all great. So we appreciate you being on. You did a great job in educating our, our, our viewers, our listeners. Uh, where can people, if they're interested in hearing more about you or learning more about you and what you do, where can they find you? Sure. So I practice in Berthoud, Colorado. I should, probably should have said that in the beginning of the podcast, but um, you can find me. I'm pretty active on Instagram. My Instagram is allnaturaldoc, 
And you can find us on Facebook. We're Gateway Natural Medicine and Diagnostic Center. So you can find us on Facebook. And that's also, you can find us online that way as well. Okay, great. So for the listeners, we're going to wrap this one up. Uh, we appreciate you being on, Dr. Katie, and uh, we got we had a lot we didn't talk about, so we can we'll probably cycle around and get you back on for a future podcast and and talk about some of the other things, stress, maybe talk about the gut biome. Uh, there's a lot we can talk about, so we'll look forward to getting you back on, uh, Dr. Erica. Any uh, final comments before we sign off? No, I think it was a great podcast, and um, I think it was great diving into the nutrition part of it. Excellent. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah we appreciate. We appreciate you, appreciate you being on. And for the listeners and viewers, uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing the podcast. I get a lot of comments from people uh, on, the, on the podcast, and we appreciate that. And if you get a chance, go to iTunes or wherever you watch the podcast and give us a great review. That would be awesome. All right, everybody, take care. And uh, Dr. Erica, Dr. Katie, have a great weekend, okay? Yeah, you too. Yeah. Take care.